Hello and welcome to Health Styles. I'm Connie Mead. We've been hearing for years now from public health officials about the increasing number of cases of diabetes, of type 2 diabetes, being di diagnosed every year. That means many people who are predisposed to diabetes uh, through their genetics and many others will receive this serious diagnosis. But does that mean we're destined to follow this path or are there steps that we can take to prevent it? Well, today we'll learn that there are, and we will learn this from an expert in the field who has spent a great amount of time studying this topic extensively. My guest today is Mary Toscano. She's a certified nutrition educator. Uh, Mary is a native of Chelmsford and currently lives in California. She is the founder of Mary Toscano Healthy Living, a company that is designed to provide tools and to educate the public regarding living a healthy lifestyle. Uh, let's see, there's a lot that Mary has going on. She is the author, she's a speaker, and she is the author of the book Sweet Fire, Sugar, Diabetes, and Your Health. And uh, she has produced two videos as well, one with the same title and one titled Fabulous Fats, Setting the Record Straight. She was recently a speaker at the Taking Control of Your Diabetes conference that was recently held in Worcester, Massachusetts. And uh, she's here today to keep us informed about what we can do to, uh, what we can do to avoid this disease. So I want to thank you for coming on the program, Mary. It's, it's a ple my pleasure. It's a pleasure to have you here. I've been looking forward to this. Right. Um, I just read your book, and it's a great book. We're going to talk more about it as we go along, I hope. But there's a lot of scientific, scientific information presented clearly, and it's very understandable, nice, easy read, and uh, we're going to talk more about that. Anyway, I want to get to know a little bit more about you and how you became interested in all this. Mm -hmm. Were you what we would call you know, a super health nut right from the start? Hardly. <laughs> uh, I actually came from a 20-year career as an engineer mm -hmm. in um, Silicon Valley, California, mm -hmm. where health and balance are extremely low priority, and I viewed food as an annoyance, you know, something that I had to deal with in order to have the energy to keep working. So when I left engineering in the year 2000 to spend more time with my daughter, my health was actually a disaster. I had mood swings, energy crashes, and my body felt achy and old. So I approached getting healthy like a typical engineering problem. So I went back to school. Mm -hmm. I went to nutrition school. I focused on blood sugar because I wanted to get a handle on these mood swings, mm -hmm. you know, especially if I was low blood sugar. You know, it, it got to the point when I was low blood sugar and I was walking down the street women would guard their small children. You know, I was that scary. And a lot of people think I'm kidding when I say this, uh -huh. but I found a picture of me from 1999 that really exemplifies what I look like to the world, low blood sugar. Uh -huh. And uh, this is Mary, <laughs> low blood sugar in 1999. Uh -huh. Yeah. Okay. So I became very focus and relentless, like engineers are, to figure out what was going on. And once I figured it out, I realized that everybody needs to know this stuff, you know. One in three people will have diabetes by the mm -hmm. year 2050. One in 10 have it now. One in three of us have prediabetes, and most don't even know it. Mm -hmm. And so, yeah, and how do you get a handle on that? You just go to your doctor for your yearly physical, and that's when you get the news that you may be pre-diabetic? Well, the problem is, and we can talk, we'll talk more about that, is that the tests that the doctors normally do mm -hmm. won't catch um, what is a better indicator of pre-diabetes. Normally what happens is that um, they do what's called a fasting blood glucose test. Yes. 
and that doesn't catch a lot of it. It didn't catch mine. Mm -hmm. So um, what's interesting is like I've been teaching this stuff for 13 years and I've been writing this book for four and a half and it was only last year I found out I was pre-diabetic. And it's not, you know, from my diet or my lifestyle. Um, I had completely underestimated the role of genetics. Mm -hmm. You know, diabetes runs in my family. Mm -hmm. So unbeknownst to me, I got handed down a pancreas that doesn't work well, which automatically puts me on track to getting diabetes. Okay, because so. usually we associate uh, people who get diabetes with people maybe who have gained weight over the years, yep. you know, into middle age and whatnot. I know it's yep. hitting people sooner, yep. but you obviously is not someone who has to struggle, I don't think, with your weight, but maybe you're just keeping it under control. I, I don't know. it under control, okay. yeah. Okay. Yeah, so that's, that's a mis... Genetics mm -hmm. is a huge factor mm -hmm. because if your pancreas from the start doesn't work well because of defective genes or defective what I call beta... what, well, what is called beta cells, mm -hmm. Um, then you're going to get it quicker than somebody who has a healthy pancreas with healthy beta cells. Beta cells are the ones that secrete the insulin. Mm -hmm. And um, with somebody with a healthy pancreas, they can regenerate beta cells if they're secreting too much insulin and they're burning the, the beta cells out, they can regenerate. Somebody who's genetically predispositioned to it um, can have beta cells that don't reproduce. Okay. or don't store insulin and, and they struggle to get the insulin out, so. Mm -hmm. Okay, do you know how long uh, pre, this pre-diabetic state can last? Is, does it vary by individual? I will be pre-diabetic forever. Okay. There's, because of my beta cells, so um, what, I mean, if I didn't write this book and I didn't um, research all this and figure this out, I believe I would have diabetes by now if I didn't know what was, you know, putting all the stress on my pancreas with the food that I was eating. Okay. So what was your diet like? Was it, were you putting a lot of stress on your pancreas? Was that what was causing these mood swings? You think it was all diet related pretty absolutely. much? Absolutely. Okay. Oh, absolutely. Yeah. Now it's hormone related. <laughs> <laughs> I know. Well, they, yeah, the mood swings can come that way too. Yeah. Yes. But, but in the, uh, 1999, it was definitely diet. And um, because there's so much food that we're eating right now that is dumping sugar into our blood that don't even taste sweet. Okay. So I, I was dumping and dumping uh, tons of sugar and my pancreas had to process it and I had no idea because the food didn't taste sweet. Okay, so now where is all this sugar? Is, are you talking about table sugar that you're adding to your cup of coffee? Mm -mm. Okay, so what sugar are you talking about? Um, the easiest way to explain it, can I explain it sure. with, um, what I like to do is have, it, it came after I figured out um, the teaspoons of sugar that I'm currently eating. Mm -hmm. So what I usually have people do is count the teaspoons of sugar that they eat. And, um, and the way, you know, why teaspoons? Because teaspoons are a lot easier to visualize than grams, which yes. is what's on labels. Yes, yes. Okay, and so how do you calculate the teaspoons? Um, there are four grams of sugar per teaspoon. So to calculate the teaspoons of sugar in any food that you're eating, you just take the... Let's give the nutrition label. I was gonna say, do we? Okay. Yeah. You just take the sugars number, which is on any label. Mm -hmm. You take that number and divide by four. Okay. Okay, so this is on the label for one cup of orange juice. Okay. So to get the number of sugars and one teaspoons of sugar and one cup of orange juice, you just take this sugar's number and you divide by four. So that's seven. You seven. have seven teaspoons of seven sugar teaspoons. in a cup of orange juice yes. the size. Yes. Okay. So and so like for an example, um, apple juice, mm -hmm. a bottle of apple juice typically has 40 grams of sugar. So that's how many teaspoons? Ten. Ten. Mm -hmm. <laughs> Ten okay, teaspoons uh -huh. of sugar. Mm -hmm. um, in a, bo a typical bottle of orange juice, that's like one more than a, one more teaspoon than a Coke, you know. So that's what I usually have people do is to look at the sugars number on any food that they're eating. Right. Um, take that number, divide by four, unless the food is made out of flour. Okay. okay. So the thing with flour 
And this is where I was assaulting my pancreas. <laughs> okay. The thing with flour Can is... Um, pull this up here or no? So this is, you're talking, is this white flour? Yep. Okay, yep. so we're talking just about plain white flour. Mm-hmm. So flour has been processed to the point where not only is all the nutrients from the original wheat berry, you know, gone, um, but the sugar in this flour will enter the bloodstream faster than if you ate plain table sugar, hmm. you know? So if you even look at flour, it even looks like sugar. Right, right, right. Yeah. So, so, so as far as your body's concerned, all of the carbohydrates in flour-based foods are simple sugars. Mm -hmm. So when you are looking at a label where the first ingredient is flour, you want to use, we'll go back to this sign, mm -hmm. the total carbohydrate number. Okay, you don't look at the sugars number, you look at the total carbohydrate yes, number. Yes, and you would take that number and divide by four. So this is something that I ate every day for years and years, mm -hmm. a, a plain bagel. Mm -hmm. And there, the total carbohydrates in a plain bagel, when you subtract out the fiber, is 48 grams. So if you take 48 divided by four, that's how many teaspoons are in of sugar are in this so bagel. That's, how that's many? 12. 12. Mm -hmm. That's shocking, isn't it? Yes, yes, yeah. yes. Because both, well, the orange juice you think is going to be healthy for you because it's orange juice. Right. And the bagel, you think it doesn't taste it's innocuous. sweet. It's innocuous. Right. You Do think you, it's, it's... 12 teaspoons is more than a jelly donut. Uh-huh. Yeah, a jelly donut has eight teaspoons of sugar. So that means when I'm eating my bagel and thinking I'm all middle, little Miss Goody Two-Shoes mm -hmm. and my friends eating their jelly donut, mm -hmm. I'm getting more sugar. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. And this is the most shocking thing, and this is where I've been tricked for so many years because foods like this don't taste sweet. Right. And you don't get that sugar rush that you get when you eat donuts and ice cream. So I had no idea my blood sugar was spiking until, you know, I started testing it. And I realized like the horrible reality of what I was doing. So it's innocuous foods like this mm -hmm. that, you know, continually cause the pancreas to s have to secrete insulin, mm -hmm. you know, to process all the sugar because insulin is what processes sugar. Right. Um, that is, is causing the, the wear and tear um, that people aren't even, I didn't realize. Sure. Yeah. So, so you're stressing it, in other words. You're stressing your pancreas. You're having it work overtime. You're having it work overtime. Mm -hmm. It's producing all this insulin. High insulin itself is d linked to all sorts of cancers. Mm -hmm. But also what's happening is you're starting, the, the high insulin is causing what is, what's called insulin resistance. Mm -hmm. So if you, you think about a drug, that you've taken for a, a really long time that first it's really effective, mm -hmm, but mm -hmm. then over time, you know, it doesn't work as well and what starts to happen, you know, you need more and more of the drug in order to be just as effective and that's what happens with insulin. Mm -hmm. So the more insulin you produce all the, you know, to process all the sugar over time, the insulin stops being effective and that's what insulin resistance is. Mm -hmm. and, and if you think about that, well, normally I, I usually, first of all, I, can I just explain sure. what? Sure. Okay. Explain. Um, this is what we're here for. Okay. I'm going to back up a minute. All and right. And actually explain what a, what a carbohydrate is. Okay. Because a carbohyd all carbohydrates are sugar. It doesn't matter if it's simple or complex. Mm -hmm. All carbohydrates are just chains of sugar units. Mm -hmm. So if you have one sugar unit, it looks like this. Mm -hmm. And it's called a monosaccharide, mm -hmm. mono meaning one. Two put together looks like this. Mm -hmm. And it's called the disaccharide, di two. two. Mm -hmm. And those are the simple sugars. And if you take a bunch and you put them together. This is called a polysaccharide, poly meaning many. Mm -hmm. This is also called a complex carbohydrate. Right. So all carbohydrates are sugar. Mm -hmm. It's just the shorter the chain. So chains like this are found in honey and maple syrup. Mm -hmm. The sweeter the taste. And the longer the chain, you, it doesn't you know, taste as sweet. So 
these are found in foods like broccoli or, mm -hmm. you know, any complex carbohydrate food. Right, right. So all carbohydrates are not created equal, shall we say? Well, they are. They well, are they created are. equal. All right. They yes. all have sugar as their building block, if you will. Exactly. But the question is, where are you getting it from? Are you getting it from... So the thing with something like broccoli will contain complex carbohydrates. Mm -hmm. And so what happens is you, you eat the broccoli, so it'll contain a bunch of these. You eat the broccoli, you ingest it, you digest it, and then the enzymes in your body will um, take these complex carbohydrates and break them apart into right. simple sugars, mm -hmm, mm -hmm, okay? Mm -hmm. The other thing going on with the broccoli is that it contains fiber, fat, and protein. Mm -hmm. All three of those nutrients will slow down how fast the sugar enters your bloodstream. And so, you know, it'll enter the, the bloodstream nice and slow, okay? Right. Now, a food that contains a lot of these simple carbohydrates, like candy, mm -hmm. um, you know, come into the come into the body. They require no digestion, and they're literally just dumped into the blood. Mm -hmm, okay. Mm -hmm. The other thing, um, so the broccoli, the sugar is going to come in slow, mm -hmm. and the candy or you know simple carbohydrate foods is just going to dump in. So foods that you know dump sugar into the blood are what is known as being high on the glycemic index, mm -hmm. which is the glycemic index is a measure of how fast the sugar enters the bloodstream. So foods like this get dumped in, and complex carbohydrate foods, um, the, the sugar will enter nice and slow. So the other factor here is nutrients. Foods like this come in with nutrients, mm -hmm. and they add to the body's nutrient store. You know, vitamins and minerals right. and enzymes and, you know. Food like this mm -hmm. comes with nothing. In fact, it requires nutrients from your body in order to digest and process it. And so they f call things like this empty calories, mm -hmm. but it's worse than that. It's nutrition vampires. Okay, okay? Right, right. So sugar is sugar. But mm -hmm. where are you getting it from? Mm -hmm. Are you getting it from something that's adding nutrients to your body mm -hmm. or taking away? Mm -hmm. Are you getting it from food that is dumping sugar into your body or coming in nice and slow that the body can handle? And that's how I look at it, you know. Mm -hmm. um, flour is actually a complex carbohydrate food. It's made of a bunch of these, but the problem is it's so processed that the minute it hits your tongue, it's breaking apart into sugar right away. Mm -hmm. And that's why it's dumping in so fast. Okay, right. Okay. They've taken all those nutrients out of it that would have slowed it down. Yes. Okay. Yes. They take the nutrients out to increase the shelf life. Mm -hmm. Because mm -hmm. if you were to take, actually here, I happen to have this. Oh, good, good. <laughs> This is a uh, wheat berry before mm -hmm. they, you know, blown up like 20,000 sure. times before mm -hmm. they make it into flour. And it's composed of three parts, the, the germ, which has these wonderful oils and um, vitamins, and the bran, which contains fiber. Fiber is so key in slowing um, the sugar down. And, but if you were to take this wheat berry, grind it up, and make it into flour, it would only last for three days. Okay. So right. in order to increase the shelf life, mm -hmm. they, you know, do things like take out the germ. Okay? Mm -hmm. So the germ has all the wonderful oils and the vitamins and it's gone. And then the miller said, okay, well, we can increase the shelf life even longer if we take out the bran. Okay. And there goes all the fiber and protein that also slow the sugar mm -hmm. down mm -hmm. and, you know, gone. Mm -hmm. So we all get constipated mm -hmm. <laughs> and what's left is the endosperm. And the endosperm is made up only of starch, okay. long, thousands of units long of starch. Uh -huh. And um, that's what hap so you're only left with this. Okay. Right. which will break down immediately to glucose when it hits your tongue. Right. One thing I just want to ask or mm -hmm. clarify, I want to be sure that people don't think that 
all carb well all carbohydrates aren't bad especially some that are bringing nutrients into yes, your body but our nutrients. body actually needs carbohydrates absolutely too. so I just don't want people to think because I hear people say oh I don't need any, any carbs I don't want to have any carbs you really do need carbohydrates to live and why is that can you tell us why oh, we easy. need carbohydrates yeah. That's what fuels our body. Right, okay. If we did not have glucose, which ultimately all carbohydrates will either be processed down to, we would be dead. Mm -hmm. Our brain and our nervous system run on glucose. It, it, it's the limiting factor on whether or not we live. Mm -hmm. You know, our brain can subsist on something called ketones, which is, um, this is what happens. This is, let me explain how we get fat and remind me about ketones. Okay. Okay. So what happens, here's your liver. Our beautiful livers live right here mm -hmm. on the left side. And what happens when you eat sugar is, so say the sugar comes in, um, some of it will be used for energy. Um, some of it will get stored away in the liver for later. We're kind of like rechargeable batteries. Mm -hmm. So we'll store some away for later when we don't have sugar, we'll, we'll get it from our storage. So it'll store some away for later in the liver and in our muscles. Um, but anything that's left over and there's not a lot that gets stored, anything that gets left, okay. any sugar gets left over gets turned into fat, mm -hmm. you know? Fat that likes and to it concentrate. Appears in different places in your body. Yeah, usually like the middle of the body. Okay. And um, it's not just any kind of fat. It's long chain, sticky, saturated fat, the exact kind we're trying to avoid, you mm -hmm. know, fat and cholesterol. Mm -hmm. Now, this is actually a good thing, um, you know, prehistoric wise, because what would happen is, is that we would go for long periods of time without food. And so this is bo the body's genius way of storing extra fuel because fat doesn't weigh as much as sugar to store. So it can take the extra sugar and turn it into fat, which was a great thing in terms of famine, mm -hmm. you know, if you, because right. it, it's nice and light and, you know, and you could store it and when you need the sugar, the fat can break down and um, provide sugar and what's called ketones um, and, ke and the brain can subsist on, on ketones for a while. Okay, okay. Yeah. I want to shift gears a little bit and talk about artificial sweeteners as well, because oh, I know you yeah. spend a lot of time in your book on that, and I think I found it very interesting uh, to read that and to just see what's in these different packets. I know that you talk about the pink one and the yellow one, and do you want to yep. just take a couple minutes and sure. tell us about artificial sweeteners and how they affect our body? Okay, I'm going to back up and say sweeteners are big business you know, billions and billions of dollars. You know, America has a sweet tooth and mm -hmm. these businesses are capitalizing on it. And along with big businesses ca come a lot of shady politics. And sweeteners are getting passed by the FDA with little or no long-term human testing. Mm -hmm. Also, these big businesses have these powerful marketing campaigns mm -hmm. that absolutely prey on consumer ignorance. And so that's why it's so, vital for us to get educated ourselves as opposed to um, being educated by their marketing. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. So that sweetener section in the book mm -hmm. took two out of the four and a half years that I took to write the book and it's only 30 pages and the references are 30 pages of you know eight point font right. um, because there is so much chemistry, marketing, mm -hmm. and politics that you have to go under to figure out what the truth is. Okay. You know? So, um, yeah, the artificial sweeteners in particular, I was actually, I was very naive about anything shady or wrong with the mm -hmm. FDA until you just have to research sweeteners a little bit and your eyes get very open. So most of the artificial sweeteners have a cancer study associated with it. The one, um, Splenda is the one that doesn't have any long-term human testing. The, the one that, um, the longest test that they did was three months with less than 200 people before they mass produced this. Wow. Yeah. And what this is, it, it oh. 
Okay. <laughs> you hit a nerve here. Yeah, you hit a nerve. <laughs> Their, their big tagline was made from sugar so it tastes like sugar. Mm -hmm. Well, yeah, they make it from sugar. But uh, the, way, the way that they do that is they, they take the sugar, they pull out what's called three hydroxyl groups, which is hydrogen and oxygen. Mm -hmm. They pull them out and they replace them with chlorine. Hmm. Yeah, I said chlorine. Yeah. yeah, yeah, like they clean our swimming pools with chlorine. Exactly. The same chlorine. Yes. Exactly. Okay. So now you have a molecule. For some reason, the chlorine made it six hundred times sweeter than sugar, but it's not sugar anymore. It's a it's a chemical that we know very little about. We do know it got changed from a hydrocarbon to a chlorocarbon. And we do know chlorocarbons are typically used as pesticides, like in the category of DDT. Mm. And these pesticides do what's called bioaccumulate, which means that they can accumulate in our fat cells. Mm -hmm. And so you'd think you'd, they'd test the heck out of that thing. Right, You right. know, just given our experience with others. And um, no, the, the longest test was three months. Right. The problem is, is that the people who make this is a hundred billion dollar company. You don't mess with them. Mm -hmm. The blue packet tried to mess with them. Mm -hmm. You know, they tried to sue them, but they're only a, um, they're a hundred billion, they're three billion, I think. There is no chance that they could, um, they just got like slapped on the hand. Yeah. Um, I think they maybe had to take away the made from sugar, taste like sugar from the mm -hmm. label. Mm -hmm. But um, yeah, there's a lot of politics in here. Okay. There's, yeah, I think because we see them all the time in every restaurant, you yes. know, they, you just, they're ubiquitous and you just think, well, they must be safe, or, you know, they're here. You, you know? think the FDA is, is protecting you, and that's why I, I, this is why I'm particularly proud of this section, because you can mm -hmm. come up to speed in two minutes what took me four or five months to research each one of these sweeteners, mm -hmm, mm -hmm. And, and you can get, you know, like the pink pack, what was that cancer study? You know, they had it off the market for a while, the saccharin. You know, right, what was right. that cancer study? You know, why did it go back on the market? And, you know, the blue packet, what, what, what was that cancer study that was associated with it? And, you know, so you're welcome for okay. that. All right, yes, thank <laughs> because, you. Okay. Because that, that was so hard to figure out those sweeteners. And I just think we should just know what we're doing. You may still choose to do it. Mm -hmm. But I think it's important that you know what you're doing. Right, right. I know we're getting shorter on time. Um, one thing I want to talk about is the way you approach making a lifestyle change. Oh, you, yes. Okay, if we could just talk about that for a minute or so. One minute? Okay. Well, maybe less, my, yeah. My yeah. basic philosophy mm -hmm. when making, uh, you know, especially at um, food in your diet is to think add. Mm -hmm. It is better to add to your diet than it is to take away because the idea is the more good things you add, the more the bad stuff just falls off the edge and it happens without you even thinking about it. Okay, so you're just crowding it out exactly, as, as opposed to depriving yourself and then you feel cheated somehow or gypped. It's like, I Denied. really want those. Right, yeah. exactly. Yeah, that's how I got rid of my pretzel habit. Now, if somebody told me you can't eat pretzels, they're bad for you, I'd be like, I don't think so. I'm going to eat mm -hmm. those pretzels. Um, mm -hmm. So it's much better to kind of use mind tricks like that. and Or just, it's just a much better way because then it's a lifestyle change. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. And it's more lasting probably. Yes. I also want to mention that your book, I know we're, we're just about out of time, your book has some great recipes. You've got about 40 or 50 pages here Thank of you. different recipes so that you can incorporate some of these changes and get the sugar out of your diet and uh, it, that can also help you make a great Yeah, uh, some of the recipes are only two or three ingredients. So, mm -hmm. you know, people want to cook healthy, they don't know where to start. So. Right, okay, and there are some other great tips in here as well. So I encourage you to pick up Miri's book, Miri Toscano's book. I think you can get it at your website. At my website or Amazon. Or Amazon, mm -hmm. and uh, you'll learn a lot about what's going on in your body what's going on with sugar and sweeteners and artificial sweeteners and learn how to incorporate some of these changes into your life. So I want to thank you, Miri, for being here. Thank you for having me. It's been a pleasure and I want to thank you as well for watching. Join us next time.